Hey folks, uh, Mr. Howard here with the beginning of your second quarter material. Uh, as we enter the second quarter, we're leaving the Anglo-Saxon period behind and we're hitting what's called the English Middle Ages. Um, if you recall, the Anglo-Saxon period went from about 450 AD until 1066 when it ended abruptly at the Battle of Hastings with William the Conqueror cutting down um, you know, King Harold of, of the Anglo-Saxons and, and starting a new age, if you will, of uh, British history. Um, this, this age, generally, the consensus is it starts in 1066 with the conquest, and it goes until 1585, which is when the first Tudor king, um, I think it's Henry VII, becomes king of England. And um, the Tudors sort of start the, the Renaissance, is what we would call it, um, you know, with King Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth and, you know, all those figures moving forward. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to do a quick historical lecture to give you some perspective on the things that have changed since Anglo-Saxon times into the, the Middle Ages. So first, before I even get into these slides, um, let's talk briefly about um, the event that changes this. I already went over it in an earlier lecture on the history of the English language, so I don't want to spend a ton of time um, talking about the conquest. But if you recall, there was an Anglo-Saxon king named Edward the Confessor, and he died without leaving a son, without leaving an heir. And so there was sort of a power vacuum in England. Uh, the noblemen of England elected this guy, uh, Harold Godwinson, to become king. Uh, and he was the most powerful man in England at the time. And, and you know, his, he and his father had both been advisors to the king. And so it sort of made sense from their perspective to sort of get together as a council of noblemen and, and elect him king. And so he was crowned uh, the last Anglo-Saxon king of England because... He didn't have any blood ties to the throne, and so um, there were a couple of people who did have blood ties to the English throne, and they wanted it. One of them was uh, a guy named William, um, the Duke of Normandy in England, and uh, he was related to Edward the Confessor and claimed that Edward had said that he would be the next king. And so he mobilized his army and his navy and started getting ready to invade. He was a very good military commander and fought lots of battles, um, you know, had, had been um, particularly pioneering in cavalry and, and using mounted knights in combat. Um, another guy who wanted control was Harold Hardradra. He was um, a... Uh, Norse king, uh, king of Norway, uh, and he gathered his Viking army of Norwegians and their ships uh, and got ready to invade as well. His story is awesome. Again, Wikipedia, that guy, if you want to read something really interesting, you know, he was he was the son of king of Norway, ended up being exiled after um, his father was defeated in a civil war, um, went to Kiev, uh, became a Viking, ultimately went down to Constantinople and joined the Varangian Guard, like this elite bodyguard of Vikings of the emperor of um, the, the Roman emperor, as he would have been known back then. Um, then, you know, fought down there until he got enough money that he bought a mercenary army, went back to uh, Norway and conquered it, uh, became king of Norway. And then he set his sights on England. He was related to um, an earlier Viking conqueror who had been named king of England, Svein, C-A-N-U-T-E, Newt. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce it. I'm not, I'm not a language expert. Uh, but he had ties to the king of England too and thought that he deserved to be king. And so they all mobilized their ships and then they're, they, um, Vikings landed first. And so Harold Godwinson, the Saxon king, marched up and fought the Vikings at a place called Stamford Bridge. Um, and he, he caught them on a really hot day where they weren't wearing their armor and half of them were on one side of the bridge and half were on the other. And he was able to rout and destroy the Viking army um, and kill Harold Hardradra. And that was a great victory for the Anglo-Saxons. But at the same time, William um, came up from the south from Normandy and landed in a place called Hastings and started looting and destroying. Hastings, of course, was um, Harold Godwinson's ancestral land. And so he force marched his army south and fought a battle at Hastings. And um, he was defeated by William the Conqueror and his cavalry. Uh, he got shot in the eye and died and the history of England changed forever. So William um, came up from Europe, uh, Southern Europe, I guess, France. And he had a lot of, of Southern European traditions. Um, he started immediately on a building campaign. He built a lot of, of keeps, these, these square towers that um, his men defended and that, you know, protected the lords from any kind of peasant revolt. Uh, he unseated all of pretty much the Anglo-Saxons in power and replaced them with Normans. He did the same thing to the church, the Anglo-Saxon church structure that was there was replaced with uh, 
Norman um, churchmen uh, who were more connected to the Pope in Rome than the English um, church had been to that point, and that changes the character of the church. We'll talk about that as we go through this lecture. Um, you know, the language changed as well. His guy spoke Norman French, and so you ended up with these two languages, the language of the peasants, uh, Anglo-Saxon, and the language of the nobility, which was Norman French. And these two languages would merge over the course of the English Middle Ages to form uh, what's called Middle English. Anglo-Saxon had been called Old English, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and so there's, there's a number of changes that happen. Another interesting thing that he does is he, he creates the feudal system. And... Uh, he in, implements this feudal system, and his, his great tool of the feudal system is something that he calls the Doomsday Book, which is a really interesting name for it, but essentially it was a, a giant tax record. Uh, he went and had guys like survey all of the holdings in England and, you know, take down all of these records and information on them. So it was sort of like a tax record so he could have a, a effective tax system. Uh, and I think that's kind of cool. Uh, this picture that you see here is the Tower of London. This was actually built by William the Conqueror. Um, it was like the biggest keep in the land. It would have been whitewashed uh, at the time. It wouldn't look, uh, it what's called the White Tower. Um, those little, uh, you know, metal, uh, tops wouldn't have been there either uh, but it would have been the most imposing structure in in the land in fact let's let's talk about some of these things um, as we go through so um, I'm gonna there we go hey look at that um, so uh, if you recall, the Anglo-Saxons used to live in these buildings called Mead Halls, uh, and you've got an image of one right here. That was the early Anglo-Saxon period. By the late Anglo-Saxon period, they were building more permanent structures out of stone, uh, but nothing like um, the high European uh, castle building that, that came with William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror's rudimentary keeps at the beginning were one thing. By the end of the English Middle Ages, they were building castles like this one. This is a Welsh castle. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Ca cavern on or something like that. Um, but you can see the, the distinct difference in building powers. Now, the, the European nations had started building keeps and castles to defend themselves against the Vikings. Uh, the Vikings would come and, and raid, and you know it was, it was impossible to stop that. And so what you would do is you'd take your population into, into walled cities, and um, the Vikings could come and raid, but they wouldn't get any of the real valuables, and they wouldn't hurt your people, and they couldn't take the castles. And so it was a, a systematic way for them to defend against the Vikings. Um, and they brought that with them when they came up to uh, England and had a big building campaigns, especially in areas that were in revolt. You have these massive castles. This one was in Wales because Wel the Welsh were always in revolt against the English, um, and there were there were fights um, constantly there. But the Welsh could never uh, completely overthrow um, English rule. They sort of did under a guy named Owen Glendower. Um, in like the 1400s, but it was brief and the English were able to resubjugate. And the reason for that is all these castles. The Welsh couldn't, I mean, can you imagine trying to take this place? Um, the Welsh couldn't take it. And so these, these fortifications were like the height of technology and, and enormously expensive and they still exist and it's kind of cool. Uh, so we have this shift. Imagine in your heads, we're going from this old Anglo-Saxon way of life to this new medieval way of life. Um, Another thing that sort of changes is uh, the warriors that we're dealing with and the technology and equipment that they've got. The old Anglo-Saxons, you know, this guy looks sort of like Beowulf. This is what you imagine when you read Beowulf. Well, we're moving from these warriors with, with axes and swords and, and round wooden shields who look like Vikings um, and chain mail to these guys in plate mail um, and, and great helms um, with these metal shields and, you know, um, the kind of knights that you picture when you talk about um, King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. So that's a shift that we're going to make. We also are moving from knights who are on foot to knights who are on horseback, right? And so you end up with these, um, you can hear my dog scratching in the background. Uh, you end up with these knights, um, mounted knights, uh, who form the backbone of the um, British Army. Uh, and that's something you want to shift in your head as well. We're, we're going from this older way of fighting with the shield wall and people fighting on foot uh, with the overlapping shields to um, cavalry charges and heavily armored uh, knights. And this is um, a major shift. I'll flip another page here. Um, so let's 
Let's start at the beginning and talk about the major changes that happened. Um, if you recall, I don't know how many of you watched that bonus video that was the wanderer being read in Anglo-Saxon, but it didn't sound a whole lot like English. Um, you know, the, the old Anglo-Saxon language, um, you can see it there on the left. Can you read that? I'm trying to read it right now and it's very difficult, but the Middle English is so the Old English transitions in a lot of ways. It goes from a uh, verb subject object language to a subject verb object language like ours is today. It incorporates a lot of Norman French words and, and changes that way. Uh, and then it, it you know, is, is almost readable. This is Middle English over here on the right. In Southwark at the Tabard as I lay ready to Wenden on my pilgrimage to Canterbury with full devout courage at night was come into that hostlery well nigh and twenty in a company of sundry folk by adventure ye fally in fellowship and pilgrims were they alley that toward Canterbury wooden ride the chambers and the stables wherein wide and well we were in est at best and shortly when the sun was to rest so had i spoken with him every chan that i was of her fellowship anon and made forward early for to rise and take our way there as i yow devise okay um Maybe you don't get that entirely, but it's a whole lot more clear than the old Anglo-Saxon was. So the shift to Middle English um, makes it a lot more like modern English than it used to be. And that's a little excerpt from the Canterbury Tales, which we're going to read second in this medieval unit. Um, we're going to start with something called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight um, right here. And uh, after we're done with that, we'll be moving on to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, probably the most famous medieval work um, in English. So let's talk about some of this english stuff um i, I already mentioned it here a uh, vso to svo shift so like the anglo-saxons put the verb first fought i the dragon killed i the monster uh drank i the wine um the french when they come in the norman french they have a subject verb object language just like all the romance languages and uh so they start talking in their French language and they put the subject first. So the two languages are very different in the way the sentences are constructed and the way they use those sentences. And as the two languages blend, um, the, the people who speak Anglo-Saxon, the people who speak Old English, they start changing the way they structure their sentence because all the high class people, all the rich people speak a certain way. And if you want to be perceived as high class, you want to speak like those high class people. And so the reason that, that English shifts from a verb first language um, to a subject first language is because verb first was viewed as barbaric. It was viewed as low class and people slowly started trying to become high class and, and change the way they ordered their words. Um, speaking of words, we have an incorporation of a lot of new words. Uh, I talked a little bit about this in the history of the English language lesson, but the French bring a bunch of French words with them. Um, and what's interesting is the French words when they, when they form into middling English don't always mean the same thing they meant in France. Um, a good example of this is food. Um, you know, there are words for animals, and these are the Anglo-Saxon words. Cow, pig, um, sheep. You know, there's, there's a bunch of them. Um, chicken. And, and the same words in Norman French that meant the animals ended up actually meaning the food because the Norman French never dealt with the animals except to eat them. And so the Norman French word for cow was beef. Um, but beef now refers to, you know, like when you're eating cow. Same thing with chicken. Um, the Norman French word for chicken was poultry. And now poultry refers to eating the chicken. Um, you know, pig, pork. Um, and you can go through and you can look at this. Another example would be the words for, for house. Um, you know, like the Anglo-Saxons lived in their house or their home. You can hear that's a very Germanic word. Uh, the Norman French lived in their machion, right? Like, which is, um, you know, now we, we think of it as like a high class home. So, well, the, that was when those people were going home. They were going to the rich person's house. And so it came to, it's a Norman French word, but it came to mean rich person's house, manor house, right? Like, um, 
you know, and so you get these these very different um, interpretations of words than they actually meant in the original Norman French. And so we have the incorporation of new words and the changing of their meanings, uh, you know, that, that happens over the, this period of time. So this language shift is very important because we're going to be reading um, two works that are written in Middle English. We're going to read them in translation, just like we read Beowulf uh, in translation. These are going to be translated as well. The first one is translated by a guy you might recognize, Burton Raphael. He's the guy who did our translation of Beowulf. Um, you know, he's not the most um, accurate translator in, in the world, uh, but he does a really good job of, of writing a translation that's easy to read, that's engaging. And I'll, like I did with the, the tower slash earth mound, I'm going to try and make sure that I clue you into some of the discrepancies that are that are, you know, grievous uh, as we as we go through this. But I think you'll enjoy the book, um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, the other translation is, um, you know, for, otherwise you'd be reading it essentially like this over here uh, of the Canterbury Tales. Um, and it's I think it's Neville Cohill who does the translation and he's he's fabulous. I think you'll really enjoy um you know, the, the Canterbury Tales as well. And we're going to get into this as we go through, but one of the things you might have noticed with the Canterbury Tales in particular is that rather than being written in alliterative verse like Beowulf is, um, where we have all those alliterations throughout, this one rhymes, right? Like, um, you know, pilgrimage, courage, hostlery, company, uh, fally, alley, ridey, widey, bestie, resty. Now, you're like, don't those have silent E's? On the end, no, there, were, there weren't any silent E's in Middle English. You pronounce those weird E's at the end of words. Um, so you can you can sort of see that we've got rhymes. This is written in couplets, and so it sounds sort of Dr. Susi to us. But rhymes were the latest thing. They were coming up from Southern Europe. And, um, you know, so uh, you're going to start seeing rhyme in, in English, which had not happened before, because it was sort of like the high class thing to do. It was what the French did in their French language. And so uh, English authors start doing it in English language to to emulate those, um, those French. So uh, let's keep moving. Uh, next important thing that happens during the Anglo-Saxon period is that um, the William the Conqueror brings in a new system of government. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons really ran things sort of by clans, um, you know, like they had families and these families were important. And that's still sort of part of the feudal system. But if you remember, the king died, right? And so how did they get the new king in England? Well, the Anglo-Saxon lords all got together and sort of voted. Uh, it was, it was, and, and if you read Beowulf, uh, you become um, famous based on your works, based on the things that you've done. Um, you know, who your father is is very important. So there is this family element of Anglo-Saxon society, but you're, you're your own person um, and, and your works affect you in this major way. Whereas with the feudal system, as, and I'm sure you've studied the feudal system in, you know, middle school or, or history class um, at some point, uh, there's essentially this, this pyramid, right? And um, you know, the pyramid is is a chain of command, and each level of the chain of command is smaller than the level underneath it. And wherever you're born on this pyramid, that's where you're going to stay. So if you're the son of a king, you're destined to become a king. If you're the son of a lord, you're destined to become a lord. If you're the son of a knight, you're destined to become a knight. And if you're the son of a peasant, well, you're going to stay a peasant, right? So uh, this is sort of the, the structure of society, this pyramid. So at the top, you've got the king um, and, and directly underneath him, you know, the incredibly rich, the people who are, are the 1%. They're all related directly to the king by, by blood or marriage, and they're, um, you know, incredibly wealthy. So uh, the king theoretically owns everything. Uh, he owns the whole country. It's all the kings. And he gives it to his lords and vassals, and they control um, their little section. And then they have these knights, and uh, they divide up their land into smaller parcels, and they give it to these knights um, and minor lords. And then they, you know take their land and they divide it up and give it to the peasants, but the peasants don't really own anything and they could be kicked off at any time. And this system works pretty well because it's a series of pyramids within pyramids, right? 
you have one king, and this king might have, um, I don't know, four, five earls. Earls are like the second most powerful nobleman in the place. These earls, you know, they control an enormous amount of land that the king has sort of given them, and they might have each four or five barons. And so these barons, you know, um, they control um, smaller chunks of land. He's the, the king had a huge amount of land. He divided it up into five earls. Those five earls have each divided it up into five barons. The barons are going to um, divide up their land and give it to, you know, eight or ten lords who each control an element of it. Those lords are going to take their land and they're going to divide it up and they're going to have knights. And these knights, um, you know, are going to control territory too. So you sort of see how it parcels down and that's the the feudal system. So if the king wants an army, he demands a certain number of men from each of his baron or each of his earls. His earls then are going to demand a certain number of men from each of their barons who are going to demand it from their, you know, knights or lords and uh, so on and so forth. And that's how you gather an army. That's also how you gather taxes. The king says, I need this much money from you. And so then the earl is responsible for gathering it from his barons. The barons are responsible for gathering it and, and so on and so forth down the line. And down at the bottom, of course, are the peasants. Um, so this is the feudal system. And you know, it worked relatively well. And I'd, I'd like to say we tend to think of the feudal system as being um, old and outdated and gone. It's not. We use feudal systems all the time. All the time. I exist in one. Uh, Prince William County Schools. Sitting at the top, we've got this guy named uh, Steve Waltz, right? He's a superintendent. And uh, he sort of is the final arbiter of all decisions that happen in Prince William County Schools. Underneath him, you have these guys called assistant superintendents. And the assistant superintendents will be in charge of uh, particular areas, right? They might be in charge of elementary school or of middle school or of high school, right? And so you've got these, these various ones who are in charge of various elements. And then underneath each of the assistant principals or assistant um, superintendents are the principals, right? The principals of the individual schools. They're, they're in charge of their own little school pyramid. And underneath them, of course, are the assistant principals. And then underneath them are the teachers. And down at the bottom of the pyramid are the students who are essentially the peasants in the system. I'm not very much above you, though, when you think about the chain, like in all the people that, that come down before me. Um, I'm like the second rung, right? And so that would be an example of a feudal system that's still in place today. Another one would be the military, right? Theoretically, you have the commander in chief. That's the president of the United States of America. And then you've got the five star generals then you got the four star generals and the three star generals and, and so on and so forth. But if you look at the, the pyramid, you've got um, fewer and fewer of these people close to the top. And then down at the bottom, you have your infantrymen, right? And it goes just like that. Um, from from top to bottom we we have a military that essentially with the chain of command is a feudal system uh and and the middle ages you know like almost everything um was a feudal system the church the catholic church was a feudal system you have this guy called the pope at the top underneath him you had these guys called cardinals then you had archbishops then you had bishops you know and each group controls a smaller um body of priest and has more control over the ones directly below him. But the church was a feudal system. Um, you had guilds, you know, and those guilds would be feudal systems. You'd, you'd have, um, you know, like um, the Masons are still a guild that, that traces back to medieval times and still has a feudal uh, setup. Another example would be the, the towns themselves. You'd have the village elder uh, who would sort of be in charge of the peasants of the town, right? And it would go on down. So you have these uh, feudal systems throughout and almost everything is organized this way and they all interlace and they all layer with each other. And this is something that William brings to England and institutes and um, very few people are able to move up and down the feudal system. We're going to be reading... Um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is written, you know, for the king and the nobility. Uh, and so it's going to focus almost entirely on this top part of the pyramid.
And that's the first thing we're going to read. The second thing we're going to read is the Canterbury Tales. And that's probably the most famous thing that was written during the Middle Ages. And what's really interesting about it is it deals with the whole spectrum of the feudal pyramid. It was written by this guy, Geoffrey Chaucer, who is sort of in between the peasants and the knights. Uh, he was the son of a merchant. And um, interestingly, we'll talk about Chaucer when we get to it. He ended up becoming a servant to... Um, lords and uh so he had a lot of experience with the rich as well as with the poor and so um and he's one of the only people in in medieval england who actually changes his status over the course of his life uh he marries a minor landed woman and uh his son ends up being a knight you know and so he moves his way up the pyramid which is almost impossible to do it's kind of cool uh but the canterbury tales deals with a slice of every every level of the pyramid except maybe the king there's there's no king there there's a knight on the on like in the Canterbury Tales. And we'll we'll talk more about that um, as time goes on. So uh, you want to pay attention to the feudal pyramid. Um, next thing we want to talk about is a shift in religion. Uh, here's a little bit of a map for you. Um, this, uh, I'm, I, I'm not worrying about the Western schism. I'm just giving you the, the kingdoms in, you know, like uh, 1400 or so. Uh, this would be like Christendom. That's That's what they would have called it. Uh, so as I said earlier, when William the Conqueror um, moved into England, uh, he replaced all the English um, church people, right? Uh, and what this did was it gave England a more southern facing focus. Uh, England up until that time had really been more associated with Denmark and Norway and these northern um, nations than it was with Europe itself, but it was it was essentially conquered by uh, northern France, you know, the Kingdom of France. And so, um, you know, it, it had this southern focus. It was focused down on what was going on um, in in Rome and with the Pope. And so um, this global focus uh, did a couple of things um, for England. England became part in a way that it hadn't before of this group that had called themselves Christendom. It was basically all the Christian nations of Europe who, even though they, they were under different kings and were fighting with each other, um, they saw themselves with a central unity, a central identity as Christians. And um, this became more and more important as the Middle Ages advanced uh, because a, a new religion came about um, the Muslim religion and it, it became a very powerful influence as the Muslims started conquering, um, you know, essentially uh, the cradle of uh, Judaism and, and Christianity in that, that area around um, the holy city of Jerusalem, you know, like and, and all of that area. And so um, they also became a threat, specifically they, the Ottoman Empire, um, became big and powerful and threatened the city of Constantinople, which was still seen as like the center of the Roman uh, world. There wasn't much of a Roman world at that point. You can't see Rome on here at all. Constantinople's off the map to the right. Um, but the, the Muslims also came up into um, Spain and uh, started conquering areas in Spain. And so, uh, you know, to thwart the increasing power of the Muslims, uh, the popes started uh, organizing crusades. Uh, all of these kingdoms, it was very feudal. Uh, they would ask for troops from all of the various kingdoms. And because the kings saw themselves as servants of God and they saw the pope as a representative of God in the world, uh, they would gather armies and they would send them on crusade to try and take back the Holy Land. And there were a whole series of crusades and they, they, you know, weren't particularly successful. I think the third one might be the one that was the most successful with Richard the Lionheart, the one that we mostly uh, think about and remember. But they were also brutal affairs, uh, massacres and slaughters. And, you know, uh, I'd like to say, yeah, on both sides, they really were on both sides. But uh, uh, the, the Christians were definitely the most brutal of, of the two sides involved. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's all of these crusades going on, and there's there's a focus on religion. Um, the religion is much more overt in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, and this one is going to have been written by a priest, and so it's going to have some of the same elements as Beowulf. It's going to be very favorable to 
Christianity and, and religion in general. But when we read Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, it's going to have a very different um, view of Christianity and the church because um, the church was becoming corrupt. When you, when you have uh, institutions that are, are so incredibly powerful uh, and there's no checks and balances on their power, uh, corruption generally, I mean, humans are, are that way. Um, corruption generally follows. And that corruption of the church, um, you know, culminates ultimately in Martin Luther um, nailing the 95 Theses to the door and, and starting Lutheranism and the, the divide between Catholicism and, um, you know, Protestant religions, uh, Protestant, right? Protestant, right. So they're protesting the, the problems with um, corruption in the Catholic religion. So, uh, you know, we, we could talk a little bit about the corruptions. Um, I'm going to save most of that for when we uh, hit the Canterbury Tales. But the big ones, for example, were um, the practice of selling pardons. Uh, let's say you, you know, are going to go to Vegas next weekend. And, um, <laughs> you know, you, you um, expect to have a very good time and do some things that are not allowed uh, by your religion, which you are, are steadfastly devout in. Well, theoretically, you could go to a Catholic priest in medieval times and you could buy a pardon in advance. You pay him some money and theoretically the money that you give to the church does enough good to forgive you for whatever sins you're going to commit that weekend, right? And so obviously this is a corrupt practice that's designed to bring the church money and the church had money. I mean, if you ever have seen pictures of the Vatican, they're still um, riding sort of the opulence that came from the wealth of the Middle Ages, the wealth that trickled up into the church. Uh, it was generally expected, for example, that people would tithe. They'd give 10% of their income to the church. Uh, tithe is a tenth. And so, uh, you know, there's that as well, aside from the other gifts. Uh, also, the, the church doctrine at the time, when you died, there was heaven, there was hell, and there was a place called purgatory. And purgatory is a place where you would go if you weren't good enough to get into heaven, but you weren't bad enough to go to hell. Uh, and you'd theoretically stay there for, for, you know, a long, long time before you could ascend to heaven, unless, you know, your relatives paid money to the church, then it would help you get advanced to heaven. And so they would buy, buy indulgences and things like that to get people into heaven who had already died. And obviously this is very different from the Anglo-Saxons. I mean, how many Anglo-Saxon poems do we have where um, nothing golden, you know, reaches to heaven or shakes the wrath for, you know, like how many, how many poems are about that idea, right? And so I think that's another element that, that you've got to think about. So there's this more global focus where England is no longer sort of isolationist, where their religion is no longer just something for um, the English people, now everything is by permission of the Pope. Everything is Southern facing and Southern focused and England becomes part of a larger world and its kings are more focused on, on sort of a global, um, you know, issues rather than necessarily just the issues of England. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, the last uh, thing that I want to talk about in this lecture, uh, and I'll try and bring this one to a close, is chivalry. Chivalry is, um, it's more important to literature than it is to, you know, the actual history of, of Europe. Uh, but it's enormously important to medieval British literature. So, Chivalry was a medieval code of behavior. It actually takes its root from chevalier, which is like a horse rider. Um, and it had to do with how you were treating your horse initially. Uh, but interestingly, it ended up building into this, this bigger and greater thing. And you want to take notes on this one because the central theme, the central um, idea of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight has to do with chivalry and a test of chivalry. So this, this medieval code of behavior was designed um, Essentially because uh, people in, in the Middle Ages, the lords and the nobility had an incredible amount of power and there were no checks and balances on their power. They could essentially do whatever they wanted to to the people under their care. And uh, people, you've heard the phrase absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, that's essentially the truth of, of the Middle Ages. People did terrible things. And uh, so they needed checks and balances. And one of the checks and balances that was invented was this idea of chivalry, this code of behavior that people of the upper class, the, the ultra rich were supposed to follow. And they essentially policed each other. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to be 
um, thought of uh, in a positive way by your peers, by the other rich, by the other lords, then you had to sort of follow this doctrine called chivalry. And essentially chivalry consists of five pillars. Now, this is a French concept. Chivalry comes up from uh, France. And that's why the, the word itself is a French word. And all of the, the pillars of chivalry are essentially translations of French words, which means you end up getting um, different interpretations of chivalry. The interpretation of chivalry that most fits Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and that we're going to talk about, um, is these five pillars that I've listed here. But you can go do some research on it if you're interested in chivalry and what it meant to be chivalrous. But it's a code. It's a code of, of behavior that they have to follow in order to be accepted by their peers. And it sort of limits um, the damage that they can do. The, the... Anyway, uh, so the first pillar, if you will, I've just listed them here. Now I'm just going to go in the order that I've listed them. But the first pillar of chivalry is faith. Um, you know, this is essentially a knight's relationship with God, right? A man's relationship with God. And this is a male um, code. It's not a code really that applies to women. Um, they're not they're not required to be chivalrous. And, and part of that is because women have absolutely no power in this patriarchal society. Um, you know, we, we get um, a couple of women that have names in Beowulf, but in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, um, you get uh, two named women, um, and I'm not going to, you know, you, you have to be a witch or a queen to get a name in Arthurian legend is essentially what it comes down to. Our main female character in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is simply called The Lady, uh, and that's it. That's that's her whole name. Uh, and so, anyway, um, faith is the first pillar of, in, in almost all areas of chivalry and faith of course is is a man's relationship with god and so you know a knight or a lord would have to put god as primary in his life which means you follow the ten commandments thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not um covet thy neighbor's wife thou shalt not kill wait hold up don't these guys kill all the time yeah there's some some interesting difficulties with the code of chivalry but faith is number one and if you get forgiveness if you you know penance for your killings you buy the indulgences or the pardons you confess uh, a lot of these things sort of get forgiven but it's about um, making the church primary in life giving your tithe um, you know following the commandments and and you know following to some extent the model of Jesus even though you're a military guy who owns land and you know whatever um, faith is important next honor Honor is very Anglo-Saxon in a lot of ways. Your honor is about keeping your word, um, just like the Anglo-Saxons um, don't make a promise that you can't keep. You have to keep your promises, period. Um, you know, so that was that was part of it, especially relates to um, your treatment of another man as, as a man. It's not just a man, though, your treatment as a knight of other knights, your treatment of equals. We'll call it equals uh, in the system. Um, it has to do with courage as well, um, being being able to um, fight and, and hold your place in line of battle and those sorts of things. So honor is about keeping your word. It's about treating your peers with respect um, and keeping that respectful attitude towards other males of a equal or higher status to you um, and, and, you know, being good at combat and those sorts of things. Uh, then we move on to courtesy. The root word of courtesy is court. Uh, and we see similar words with courtship and courtier and, and stuff like that. So um, this was essentially the relationship of a knight with a lady. Um, this was the thing that was designed to give women some power to counterbalance their um, role in society at the time. And so in, in the code of chivalry, uh, a knight is honor bound to do whatever a woman asks him as long as it doesn't interfere with the other pillars of chivalry. So a lot of medieval stories actually have to do with with courtesy. Um, you know, a lady will will ask a knight to go on a quest for her. She might say, hey, you know, I, I really want this particular flower that only grows on top of this particular mountain. And the knight will be sort of honor bound because it doesn't interfere with other elements of a chivalry to go up and, and get this flower. And of course, when you get up to the top of the mountain, there's a dragon there and it's like, you can't have my flower, right? And then there's a giant fight 
And, uh, you know, it, that's that's sort of how the whole thing goes. And that would be a courtesy story. Uh, but there's other situations where, where damsels are in distress. Another element of courtesy is you've got to defend a woman if she needs defending, um, you know, and you've got to, uh, you, you can't mistreat her. You can't do things like, you know, force yourself on her or um, force her affections. And so good knights are always championing ladies. They, they often wear a lady's favor on their arm uh, as they go into combat. And they do all of these things to prove their love to a lady. And that was, um, you know, something that, that chivalry is sort of based on, this, this romantic relationship. And we're going we're gonna to be reading um, Sir Gavin and the Green Knight, which is a medieval romance. And uh, we're going to see this firsthand. So courtesy was important. It had to do with your relationship with a woman. Humility was generally the relationship of a knight to somebody of lower class than he was. And so if you're a knight or a nobleman and you're dealing with those peasants, it's, it's very different from Anglo-Saxon attitudes. In Anglo-Saxon attitudes, humility was something people didn't have. They almost like, I drove five great giants into chains, chased all that race from the earth. You know, like he's constantly bragging about his prowess. And that was something the Anglo-Saxons did. Um, a knight is not supposed to do that. A knight is supposed to treat people who are poorer than him with generosity, with kindness, um, with pity. Uh, and, and a knight is supposed to stay humble and not talk about his great accomplishments. Your accomplishments speak for themselves. You yourself don't have to speak of them. Uh, others will do that for you. So uh, the idea was sort of to stay humble and, and within yourself, which is a big shift um, from the old way of the Anglo-Saxons. So humility is, is one of them. And then the last one is purity. Um, you are supposed to stay pure and true to yourself and your ideals. So you're not supposed to sleep around. You're not supposed to, um, you know, do, do impure things, say impure things, think impure thoughts. And that all um, is part of your code of chivalry as well. So what's interesting about this uh, is that a lot of the, because this is something that deals with just the top of the feudal pyramid, right? Like the nobility. Uh, stories about the nobility are almost always stories of chivalry. And the stories of chivalry are almost always stories of um, the internal conflicts within the code of chivalry. We've got all these knights who are trying to live up to a code of chivalry. And if you recall, Beowulf was an ideal, right? He, he represented um, sort of an unattainable uh, example of perfection, and people are trying to live up to that example of perfection by emulating him. Chivalry is the same thing, except it's not embodied in a physical form. It's a code. And you're trying to live up to this ideal that is chivalry, but it turns out that chivalry is unattainable. And almost all of the stories of medieval romance are stories about failures to attain the code of chivalry, but how trying to attain it makes you a better person because it's ultimately unattainable. And so there's, there's internal inconsistencies and conflicts within chivalry. So let me give you an example. You're supposed to do whatever a woman asks you. Um, you know, that's, that's called courtesy. What if a woman asks you to sleep with her and she's married to somebody else? Well, that's an internal conflict because you're supposed to do what a woman says, but purity and faith. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Um, you know, and, and so we got internal conflicts within the code. How do you, how do you organize? How do you structure this? Um, another example would be honor conflicts. Let's say that we've got two knights, Sir Bors and Sir Bedivere. Okay. And they grew up together and they made a promise when they were young that they would never fight each other, that they would always be true brothers in arms or whatever. Well, they both go off and they end up serving different kings. And lo and behold, um, when they're older, their two kings get in a war and they're lined up on opposite sides of the field of battle. Um, the obvious solution for them is that they're not going to fight each other. Um, you know, but for whatever reason, one of them has to wear armor that he's not used to or whatever, and they end up fighting each other in combat. And, uh, you know, how do they deal with the the situation here. What's more important, your honor to um, to the person that you pledged as a youth or your honor to your king? Doing your duty to the king or doing your duty to your friend? This is a terrible question and a conundrum. And that's something that you'll probably, you know, run into in, in medieval stories. So there are honor problems. Then we've got courtesy problems. You know, like I already gave you one, uh, but let's say um, Sir Bors is, is riding through the woods and this lady comes running out and she's like, oh my God, this terrible knight has, you know, 
impinged my honor and called me a, a strumpet. You know, like that's the medieval word for, you know, women of loose morality. Um, you know, will you defend my honor? And of course you're supposed to do what a, what a woman says. And so uh, Sir Bors is like, absolutely, I'll defend your honor. And then she turns around and she's like, that's the knight who said this terrible thing to me. And, and of course, it's Sir Bedivere, the guy he promised he would never hurt. Uh, when he was a kid. And so what's more important, your honor, the word that you gave, or your courtesy defending the honor of a woman who has been wronged? Um, you know, and, and who do you believe in this situation? You know, is it, is it bros before women of questionable morality? Um, I'm not sure. But this is a another problem that happens with chivalry. Um, you know, and so a lot of these stories end up being tests of chivalry sort of stories that, that place these chivalry paradoxes front and center and ask us to decide what's more important. And um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is going to be one of those. And you have some parodies of chivalry in Chaucer when we get there. All right, I've talked for 45 minutes and this is a really long lecture. Um, but, you know, you got to have the historical context to understand what you're reading. So I'm going to draw this to a close and um, thank you for watching.